Welcome everyone. This is uh, Designing a Distribution from Scratch Part 2. I did Part 1 in ELC San Diego. You can view the slides from that link or from the ELC site and I think also from the eLinux wiki. So the initial abstract was about init systems and C libraries and I wanted to have a talk about that but then at work I had to deal with BSPs and integrating the Mali binary only driver. So a large portion of the presentation will deal with that. If you have any questions, just raise your ha uh, hand and then start speaking. I'll repeat the question. The room is small enough that we don't have to do mics around. And if we do, Sean volunteer to be You're the welcome. mic carrier. I always start uh, open embedded presentation <laughs> <laughs> Pres with, with the naming confusion and Bihan actually had sh uh, shirts printed. It's a bit hard to see, but it has Y O umlaut P. This is for Yocto open embedded pokey uh, because people use the names interchangeably and when they shouldn't. So most recently someone in our enterprise group explained it perfectly to me. He said the Yocto project is like Tianacore and open embedded is like EDK2, and now everything makes perfect sense. I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> so, open embedded. Open embedded is a build system, which is part of the Yocto project as a Yocto, uh, the Yocto project. And the closed equivalent is build root. So it's not a distribution. So your device does not run open embedded. It most certainly does not run Yocto. You are allowed to call it Yocto Linux because that pisses off the Yocto project people. <laughs> so open embedded consists of recipes, config files, and a task executor called Bitbake. And for the BSB talk, uh, you have to remember we have three orthogonal concepts in open embedded. One is a machine that describes the target hardware and the the feature, so it, it says it's a PowerPC CPU, it has a screen, it has Wi-Fi, etc. Here you have a distribution config which sets policies like selects the init system, selects the C library, and does some other things. For example, in a distribution, you can turn off all graphics for a headless thing. So even if your machine says, I have a screen in the distro, you can say, yeah, that's nice for you, we're still not going to use it. And we have image recipes. This is where you have a collection of software packages in an output format like X4 or a tarball. And uh, Open Embedded combines the distro and the machine and your image recipe to output that. So in theory, you should be able to use any image with any distro and any machine, but there might be something going on if you have an image written specifically for a certain machine. So, init systems. In theory, you can use any init system you want in an OE build. In practice, uh, you're limited to the init systems OE, core, and or the layer support. So, that basically is SysV init or systemd. We tried to integrate Upstart, but we ran into the fundamental design problems that Upstart suffers from, and we hit them in, in OE because the reverse dependency issue. So the choice is between SysV in it and SystemD. The default is SysV in it. And to select SystemD, it's sadly not a one-time thing. So you have to add SystemD to your distro features then you have to remove sysv init from distro features. Then you have to give a hint to all the image recipes that you want systemd. And once you've done that, you notice it that it doesn't really do a lot. So then you have to change the systemd package config to add resolve and network daemon. And then you notice that it still doesn't really work. And then you have to add PAM to your, your distro feature. So if you pick a different init system, know what you're getting into and do a lot of testing because it's not as easy as flipping a switch and say, I want system D. It takes some configuration. 
C libraries, similar story. glibc and uclibc are supported in OE core. Muscle is, yes, Richard? Richard says uclibc has been dropped. Yay! So, the issue with uclibc support in OE was by default it turned on uh, NLS, which included icon V. So if you actually built an image, it would be larger than the glibc equivalent for small images. So you had to do, like in the previous slide with systemd, had to do a lot of tweaking to get it down, and then you notice that uclibc is not the right choice. Uh, meta muscle. Uh, muscle is a meta muscle that seems to be a better choice nowadays and using it is adding the layer setting tc libc as muscle and bit big my image so muscle is in core i'd looked at an old checkout so it's in core now so you don't even have to add the layer and uh, since it's integrated into core all the patching has been done for you at least for core and for the layers that Cam cared about, you still might have to patch some other software because Muscle doesn't provide the same thing as glibc. It's getting a bit better because Intel's uh, pet distribution, Clear Linux, is using it, and they are sending patches all over the internet. So maybe next year we'll have a talk about deleting glibc from OE Core. <laughs> <laughs> so like I said, uh, in the UCLipsy case, people would say it's a lot smaller, but in the default co configuration in OE, it wasn't. Uh, NLS was turned on by default, and lib icon V was included, and yeah. And muscle seems to be displacing. As Richard had just said, it has actually displaced it. So, good. And now to the part that I actually want. So, BSPs, you might know. John Masters, he is a big fan of standards and he hates cute embedded nonsense hacks, so I wore the shirt that I do cute embedded nonsense hacks. And he keeps talking about the embedded zoo. So if you think about it, the Linux kernel supports all different types of machine and it supports runtime configuration, be it device tree or ACPI or DD forbid SFI. So why do we have BSPs? Well, because people think their product is special. And if you're ARM or an x86 BSP, you think you are really special. So that's why in the open embedded world, we really have to deal with BSPs. And since every, there is no quality control because everyone can start their own layer, there are no standards to live up to, and BSPs in general have a very low metadata quality because people create one to scratch their itch uh, if you buy the product, the company will support it. If you haven't bought it, they have no incentive to support it. So this is not a complaint against Open Embedded or the Yocto project. This is squarely on the shoulders of the, of the maintainers. And to make it worse, uh, due to it being low quality, using multiple BSPs in your distribution is actively discouraged by quote unquote, Yocto. If you read the documentation, go on the ROC or the emailing list, basically say like, yeah, don't do that. So lots of people tried to fix the problem from different angles. And uh, a few years ago, Darren Hart said, hey, I wrote a tool to automatically enable one BSP and disable all the others. And if you select a different machine, it does all that and that avoids all the problems. And you're like, you're not avoiding the problem because one BSP might change this config option and the other might change the other option. So you have still differences in between your builds that aren't machine related just because everyone is Snowflake special with their BSP. And uh, I would recommend in integrating them one by one and then run bit big diff sifts and I forgot Chris Larson's tool to check what the BSP is actually changing. And you'll be surprised at what the BSP changes when you think like that's not related to the machines. And if you send patches, the maintainer will generally don't care or don't understand the interaction issues. He will say, it builds for my distro and my BSP layer so everything works. I'm like, yes, but if you add this other BSP layer and generally the response will be, so fix the other BSP. 
So you are a maintainer and suddenly you get an email from me or patches. And then you say, what is actually the problem? So most of the ARM BSPs poke at floating point ABI, which is a distro setting. And uh, the net result is I have two devices on my desk, both use in Cortex A8 CPU in their SOC. One is by Freescale, one is by TI. You think same CPU, I build for one machine, build an application, move the application to the other machine, and the landscape is on. And suddenly, and suddenly your application doesn't run. And you're like, but I used OE and they're the same CPU. Why didn't it work? Well, it turns out that Freescale says, well, the OE default is soft float, but we don't want that. We just force hard float for our very special machine. And the maintainer doesn't care about that. He refuses to apply the patches to fix it, which he does by setting default tune. So the side effect of setting the full tune is that it also changes package arcs. So you build for your TI machine, you get a package architecture called ARM V7 T2 VFP Neon. And for your Freescale one, you get something called Cortex A8 minus no A time, oh my god. <laughs> so it even breaks package management. There we have some work done in, in OE Core by Mike by mainly Mark Hadley to automatically generate all the options so all the packages will be compatible. But from a distribution point of view, you now have a 10 gigabyte feed for this one and a 10 gigabyte feed for that one, and they're largely the same. That's just wasting space and other things. And another thing you will see in BSPs, they have an append for libdrm that has patches that apply to a single libdrm version. So if it gets updated in a stable update, or you have another layer with a more recent libdrm, it fails to build because you have 2467 and the patch are against 2466. Um, most of th that specific problem has gone away. The patches were accepted and both for the BSPs and upstream. So 2467 has most of the offending patches we had in the in the BSP. So that has been, is now a problem of the past, luckily, but it might happen with other recipes. So if you have a BB append, please, please, please version it. If you need to have a floating BB append, be very clear why it needs to be floating and check if, it, if the patch is version specific. And there are BSPs that have, I kid you not, a glibc recipe that changes a single option, but they include the complete recipe. And in your layer stack, if you arrange it in a certain way, then that recipe takes over the OE core recipe, and that doesn't have good results. Uh, another one that is harder to track down, the Linux libc headers BB append, which means that suddenly the C library you build will have different features like missing syscalls and things like that. And that's something you don't want because it's really hard to track down because you're, you track it down to your C library and you cannot find any changes in a glibc recipe except you find a BSP that changed it. You remove that, you still have the problem and then you have to track it all the way down to Linux libc headers. And in this case, that took me two months to realize where the problem actually was because you think it is, these are just a bunch of headers. Why would this be a problem? And as you will see later in the talk about the GPU blobs, Mesa baby appends that delete all the libraries in do install with any, without any override safeguards. And this happens because people need the Cronus uh, OpenGL and EGL headers. Mesa provides them. Uh, their binary blobs do not for some reason. And uh, so they BB append Mesa to delete all the libraries. So you build for your ARM machine, Molly comes up, 3D work, you think, awesome. Then you take out your Minnow board, you boot it up, and it doesn't work. And if you have a more recent Linux Doctor recipe <coughs> than OE Core, really bad things will happen because it will tend to pick your version that you customized for your machine and all the other BSPs using the Linux Doctor recipe 
will try to build your recipe. And it works just well enough that the build succeeds, but it won't boot. And like I said, uh, especially in, in the ARM ecosystem, people are really fond of picking the default tune for they say, I have a Cortex-A9, I have to pick the Cortex-A9 tune, not the Cortex-A8 or the generic ARM because it's a lot faster. And then I usually say, show me the benchmarks. And then they go like, oh, but there was this article on LWN by some Debian people. I'm like, yes, but they compared hard float to soft float and not soft FP to hard float. Have you done that? And go like, no, I have not. And then when they actually benchmark, it shows no real life difference. And then usually they can be persuaded back to uh, not poking at default tune, but, but just saying, I'm an ARM v7, I'm an ARM v8, I'm a power PC, and then things get a lot easier. And if they don't, you have to include, include this bit of Python in your distribution that basically says, finds the ARM v7 machines, looks at the features, and then resets default tune. So we have this in Angstrom for my pet project. And now the Linaro open embedded uh, reference distribution also includes this, because without this, building for an ARM v7 BSP, more than one is, is a maintenance nightmare. And uh, this saves you a lot of heartache because it automatically fixes things and you don't have to bother with all those maintainers. And so it's a bit of a mixed blessing. And that's why I was surprised that things started failing when I was working for my J-Job at the Linaro distribution. I'm like, this works for Angstrom, why doesn't it work? And then you look at what the BSP is doing and then you go like, oh, yeah. So it's <laughs> Yes. For, for, for ARM v7, this takes away the, well, it takes away s the most used ability. So uh, this is a magically a magical unbreak me thing. And if you look through the Git log, it keeps getting bigger and bigger because uh, the new uh, lower power ARM v7 cores support virtualization. So OE core added ARM v7 VE which I had to add two weeks ago to fix the uh, uh, all-winner BSPs. So ideally, a BSP uh, would be a single Git repository having multiple layers and a base layer that would have kernel bootloader firmware. So the bare minimum that you would need to get your machine to boot a second layer would be with all the nice to have things like codecs, Wi-Fi, DSP, media, whatever. And a third layer where you go BB append uh, other recipes. And that's where the problems will be. And, and these are, this really happened. People were BB, uh, BSP was, was BB appending BusyBox and it only added RF kill but it did it in such a way with immediate expansion that it killed other BusyBox BB pens that were in the distro layer. And it turns out they just needed RF kill to uh, turn on their Bluetooth thing, which in the end turned out that they actually needed a command config file to do the same. So the whole RF kill binary problem went away after they realized that. And then they had a different problem that their machine needed a config file for conman while that is a distro thing. Eventually they went with their own distribution to fix things like that. But that shows how you have one problem, you solve it, you the problem moves elsewhere. And this one was a real gem. A BSP disabled Pixman support everywhere. They spent a lot of time doing that and patching all the software to add their 2D engine and it was awesome because their 2D engine was actually an FPGA. But suddenly, Pixman broke everywhere else. So, yeah. So, GPU blobs are a bit difficult because they're needed to make the, the 3D on the machine work. So, should you enable them in, in the BSP? Is it 
is it the distro policy? Because for some things like on for NVIDIA cards, you have an open source driver and the vendor provided binary. Where do you make the choice? Do you make it a distro policy? Do you do that in the machine? Uh, I would tend to say it's, it's a distro policy, but you need to be able to set a default in the machine. Otherwise, you will have BSP layers that have a readme saying, this is what you need to do to make it actually useful. And we should try to avoid that because if you have a layer, it should do the best it can instead of being, you have to do everything yourself. And I've looked around and there aren't really any best practices around. And especially in the Armada situation, everybody does it their own way. And luckily for my day job, I had the opportunity to look at a system that might improve things. And I think it's improvement on the current situation. It isn't the best solution. So the problem was, is as I described, people were deleting the Mesa libraries because they needed the headers. Okay, fine. We can do that. And they needed uh, a way to inject uh, the Mali libraries as a provider for virtual OpenGL, EGL, GLS, that's okay, but there was really not a good way to do it. So every BSP had a BB append for Mesa saying do install append machine, etc. And then for the second machine, they copied that block and append second machine. So, and the distribution layer had for this machine, do this. For the other machine, do exactly the same, and that led to a lot of duplication. So what we came up with was a distro include that looks at a machine feature. So your machine says, I machine features is Molly 450. And if this Python code finds that machine feature, it will automatically set the Molly uh, binary blob as a provider for uh, virtual, EGL. virtual EGL, yeah. The downside of this recipe is that if you don't have a Molly machine, it will automatically set it to Mesa. So now your distribution supports Mesa or Molly and not any of the others, which isn't a problem for the distribution at work yet, but this needs some improving. Uh, the issue was you can look up what uh, the provider is set to, but if you try to restore it, you run into a recursion loop. Uh, that's probably easily fixable, but we ran out of time because we had a September release to do. So that we need to look into that, what the problem is and see if it's a bug in Bitbake or in our code and try to work around it because just forcing Mesa is just as bad as forcing Molly. And for the blob recipe, it includes a bit of code that we lifted from the, the TI BSP that basically checks for features and uh, disqualifies us if you don't meet the feature. And what TI does in their BSP for their binary blob, their binary blob is in hard float. So they check if you have hard float and if you don't, they throw uh, an error saying this only supports hard float, which is good because the free scale BSP forces hard float to make the binary blob work. So if you have a headless IMX6 machine, you go like, I don't care about that. And that's where the magic Python comes in. And a while ago, someone on a comment in a Linux Weekly News article had a simple list of things that a project, be it an application, library, or something like OpenStack, which is a collection of projects, uh, could make it easier. I forgot what the article was about. It maybe was something about own cloud. But what that person said is, try to use a standard build system like Automake, CMake, Setup Tools, whatever, something that is widely used. Don't roll your own unless you know what you're doing. And in all the years that I've been doing this, there has been only one project that knew what it was doing, that is FFmpeg. They rolled their own configure, their own, rolled their own mail, make file. It works, it supports cross, Canadian cross, anything you can think of. So if you're not FFmpeg, please stick to a standard uh, build system and don't try to roll your own. Samba switched to WAF. 
they were like, this is so much better than all the tools. It rocks, and it's WAF, and it's Python, and it's awesome. And then you go, like, and cross-compilation, and you're silent, 4.1. Yeah, we support cross-compilation, and what they mean is they just fire off QMU. You go like, yes, but my architecture doesn't support QMU. Oh, yeah, we, we, you can have a file where we cache the results. Not some results, but the results. And you go like, OK, can I use both? Samba 4 to 3. You can use both. So it is an iterative process, and you can now kind of cross-compile Samba, but the switch from autoconf to WAF wasn't a good thing for uh, distributions. Have a clear license de declaration. Uh, copying file is standard. You might think, of course, we have a license declaration. Uh, that isn't the case for a lot of projects. You have to look into the source. What the licenses are, sometimes it has multiple licenses, so please have a copying file. Uh, in the past month, GitHub updated their UI, and it will now look for uh, licensing in the repository and actually show the license in the top right-hand corner, which is a big, 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 big improvement on the previous state. So you can now see that 90% of the GitHub projects don't have any licensing. Include unit tests. Uh, this is, in the OE context, uh, a bit weird. I think p-test, execute, make check, I haven't actually used it yet, so please do. And OE goes a long way to be able to execute them. Uh, it really helps for doing validation and spotting problems earlier on. This use package conflict for the dependency, that goes back to using a standard build system, but even in other tools, and especially CMake, you have a lot of freedom to detect things on your own, but please use package config. For example, Cody is using from, moving from other tools to CMake, and their find SSE method to look for uh, SSE in Intel CPUs looks at proxy CPU info. So people, please don't do that. Have regular releases, at least for bug fixes and security uh, fixes. Uh, we really like that in Open Embedded. If you have a clear stable branch, that means that we can do, when there's a release branch, it is easier to do to update that to a stable release because you know the ABI won't change. It still needs a lot of testing and, and the blessing for the from the various maintainers, but if you have a project, please have at least a tag for your release and uh, know what an ABI break is. If you're using C, that, that is fairly obvious. Uh, C++ makes it a bit harder, not because of C++, but mostly of because of GCC. The bad things. Uh, custom make file hackery, not including a desk there, which uh, for OE builds, we really like a desk there that you, that you as a product decide what files you install. And as Open Embedded, we like to decide where it gets installed. So if you have a make file, please have both of these things, both what to install and where to install. And uh, this is a nice one. You have units tests, and they always fail. Mm -hmm. No clear license. Someone will say it doesn't have a license, so you can use it as well. No, that's not it. That person usually means this is public domain. So if you encounter such a project, please point them to uh, usually the uh, Creative Commons website that has a good explanation of why no license is bad. And if you say that you probably mean public domain, and usually people go like, oh, thank you for explaining it to me, and they update their license to public domain, and the problem goes away. But if you have a problem, uh, see a project without a license, please uh, contact them and ask them to uh, clarify the situation. And related to Desdir, have created ideas where files go, libraries in bin, binaries in slash lib, et, et, et cetera. Uh, when in doubt, please follow uh, the FHS, the and to, our, to which I will say a subset of the FHS because the FHS allows slash OPT, which is a free for all. So ignore slash OPT and please stick to user, et cetera, for and things like that. Not using the system C flags. 
that one is really noticeable in the open embedded context for uh, cross compiling because we have to pass in the flags, uh, especially for the compiler OE builds because you can reuse that with, with different flags. So the built in default might not make sense. And we actually don't build in a default in the cross compiler. So if you, your machine and your distro agree that you should use hard float, a compiler gets built and the compiler libraries are hard float, but the compiler itself has no built in for hard float. So you have to specify the, the C flags. So in the hard float case, it goes horribly wrong if your project overrides C flags because it will fail to link. And this one, for project maintainers, they don't like this suggestion. Don't add W error to C flags. It seems like a good idea because we said you need to have uh, unit tests, make check, etc. But W error does not only catch uh, errors in your project. It catches errors in all the libraries and includes uh, your project uses. So going back a bit, your BSP patches Linux libc headers. They do it badly. Anything that needs a C library that uses minus W error will suddenly fail to build. So you're like, GStreamer, why do you fail, fail to build? And they go like, we don't know. And it turns out to be the C library. So if you want to do W error, please only do that in maintainer mode or in your make this script so that it gets checked automatically, but in the release it gets turned off because it catches way too much outside of your application. And especially if you work on weird architectures that have no official support, uh, upstream like AVR32, uh, W error will just error out everywhere. So those were my slides. And I usually reserve a large portion of my talk for questions. So, Matt. So, this is a, a question around the realm of BSP best practices. Mm -hmm. So, the first part is um, when, when dealing with BSP layers, uh, as, as you know, there's a lot of bad stuff out there. But one thing I see is that there's a lot of prol proliferation of duplicate ones. Right? So, So the yeah so part it was a two part question part one was with BSPs you see a lot of duplicate for example or winner you have meta sunk C you have meta chip you have meta chip you have meta chip seeing a pattern there uh, what's the best practice to deal with duplicates um, taking the specific meta sunk C example uh, meta sunk C has a bug file that they need to add uh, chip support and someone showed the patches that he did and yeah that's just anything you can do wrong he did wrong and they are keep working on that bug and you basically like no you need to delete all that and and start from scratch and they didn't really like that so uh, multiple people started the meta chip on their own because they needed support um, in the long term if meta sung c wants to support the chip we should all work together and merge the different meta chips into meta C. There is work being done to merge all the meta chips into a single one. Uh, for the other ones, it, it depends if your uh, big BSP wants to support your product. For example, uh, TI BSPs, TI says we care about these boards, these are our internal EVMs, these are our blessed products like BeagleBone, we support that, but your little TI based de device, we aren't going to support that as a silicon vendor. So then you probably need to do your own BSP, but it's always a, a conversation. And 
the big BSPs can make it really easy to base your BSP on top of it. So for Freescale, they use SOC family and things like that. So you can include it and derive from that. So your the BSP for your favorite board can be really small, just a thin layer on top of the other BSP. But you also see, like we currently have a meta chip, that the three chip BSPs just duplicate everything from each other because they either didn't know or didn't agree with what was happening. And the best you can do is uh, get the maintainers to talk to each other and, and, and send patches. There isn't really a one size fits all. It depends on the big BSP, but ideally there shouldn't be a lot of duplications. But like we saw with GCC and eGCS, duplication and forks can be a good thing. And what is the second part? So Ken was saying he looks at the amount of stars the it the project has on GitHub as as an in indication. Maybe also do the reverse, like on Amazon, look out, look out uh, at how many people ranted about it, because that's that would be the thing that break for you too. Yeah, the, but the rantings are are a bit hard to spot because on, on some people file issues on on the project bug tracker, but did you also have tons of blog posts and social media posts, and they can be harder to find. GitHub, but, uh, GitHub needs anti stars. That's the point. <laughs> yeah. So Matt. Uh, this one. So, yeah, um, so, uh, this is a platonic ideal. Number one is, makes perfect sense. So where it gets hazy to me is those ones absolutely make sense. I know why you have there, but could you elaborate on what other things would like typically go into that second layer and what, what the boundaries are that you Yeah, so, so the question. So the question is, where do you draw the line between one, two, and three? Uh, what goes into number two? Uh, that that line is is a bit vague. Like I said, with with the binary blob issue, uh, there is some overlap between the distro and, and and things like that. And it's you need to look at that on on a case by case basis. If your codec does bad things to other recipes, then you might need to move it down to the third layer. But if it's just bad code, but it doesn't affect anything else and you need it to make your device useful, then you can move it in, in the second layer. I try to see that if something influences other things, that can break other machines, you probably need to move it in, in number three. So one should always be safe to include, number two should be mostly safe, and number three should just not be included by default. That is what I think would be a good line to draw. You cannot draw a hard line because would you say it's kind of those special case kind of shows the new drivers and stuff and then like, 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 Yeah, this is special fender drivers. Uh, yeah, so user space, Wi-Fi drivers, etc. that goes into a second layer. But if you have a horrible fender driver that you need to boot, it sadly goes into the base layer. You know, let's say that the third layer is specific configs that the vendor uses on their EDK or something like that. Yeah, the, 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 the third layer would be specific configs that if you would ask 10 OE developers, is this a distro thing or a machine thing, and you get 10 different answers, then that's the third layer. <laughs> and then, sadly, there are a lot of things. Um, for most things, you can see, you can say, just don't poke at ABI. But there are like GPU blobs. You go like, you want something that works and not saying, here's my BSP layer and here's the 12-step program to make it work. No one likes that. Any more questions, remarks? Okay, well, thank you. <laughs>